Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Collider Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campy. I'm the senior producer over here at Collider Video, and it's really nice to be back in the flow of doing mailbags again. I hadn't done mailbags uh, in like a month during all the crossover and the upheaval and the uncertainty when I didn't know where I was going to be and all that kind of stuff. But it's really great to be back doing mailbags. I have a lot of fun doing these things. And um, this week, we're going to do something a little bit different. On tomorrow's mailbag, on Sunday's mailbag, what we're going to do is we're actually going to try a little experiment. We're going to try live streaming. So we are going to do it live at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's 10 a.m. Los Angeles time um, or Pacific Standard Time. So we're going to try doing it live tomorrow. And it's going to be all, um, it's going to kind of be like an ask me anything sort of thing where I think I'm going to have Wendy is going to be here with me and she will be watching the chat board and just she'll be picking out your questions live and we'll go for like, Anywhere between a half hour and an hour, we'll do it for. And I'm kind of excited about that. We haven't done like a live thing like that uh, with Mailbag in a while. So I'm really looking forward to that. I hope you guys can come and join us for that. Um, before we get into the um, Mailbag questions today, um, I, I touched on this on Movie Talk the other day, uh, but I, I kind of want to clarify some things. You know, um, by now, all of us have heard about the uh, movie theater shootings in uh, Lafayette, Louisiana, and like the tragedy that that is. I mean, and I decided normally when something really heavy happens or there's something to address to make it so I don't screw up. I usually will do like uh, get write it up myself, write up a, a copy and write up a script for myself and then put on a teleprompter and I'll read it off to make sure I say it right because it because they're important issues. I remember I did that with um, when Robin Williams passed away. I did that um, when uh, some of the controversies were going on and I thought I should have did it yesterday and I thought, no, I can do it without it. And sure enough, as I watched uh, movie talk yesterday, I realized I blundered that. I, I, it came across the wrong way, and but I didn't really say what I wanted to say. But anyway, um, a horrible tragedy. It's terrible, especially when you consider that you know we go to the movies to escape <laughs> from reality quite often and only to become face to face with it. And it's really unfortunate that we as human beings can be affected by the actions of other, you know, morons uh, that live around us. And uh, that's the case here now. <clears throat> but at the same time, you know, I'm reading film fans. Like, how should this affect us as film fans, as movie fans? And I'm, what we are as a species is we are really reactionary. We are. I mean, something happens, we instantly react, like sometimes and quite often to a really big extreme. So, for instance, I, I was reading some film fans online, well-meaning film fans that I have no problem with. I mean, I, I, I disagree with what they're saying, but I totally get where they're coming from. Um, you know, saying things like, you know, it's time to install metal detectors on all movie theaters. It's, it's time to have armed guards in all movie theaters. And I remember thinking, well, I, I mean, I, that feels like a bit of an overreaction. I mean, un it's unfortunate that any public place, I mean, we've seen it in the news where, where mass incidents of violence happen in shopping malls or in, you know, government buildings or, you know, in public parks or in, you know, all over the place. But if we just take back and step back and take a deep breath, you know, there have been two incidents now in four years. And when you consider, uh, and none of this is to take away what the tragedy that happened in Lafayette. It's just, I don't want us to overreact to think this is now a pandemic of some sorts, you know? Because um, when you sit back, there's like major theater chains, I think have like 20,000 movie screens in the United States. I think when you count all the smaller ones as well, I think there are close to 40,000 movie screens in the United States. And considering you have, let's take just take the major th theater chains, you know, Cinemark, uh, Regal, AMC Theaters, and a couple of the, the other big, more major ones, you gotta figure between 20, probably 25,000 movie screens that they have collectively. And then you figure, of all those movie screens, there's probably at least three showings a day. Each screen's probably closer to four. You know what, let's say four. Each one of those major film screens have like four screenings a day put up on them. That's like 100,000 times every day in the United States, a movie is shown in a theater and a bunch of people come in. That's 100,000 times a day. Times that 
by 365 days out of the year, times that by four years, and it, the number is so infinitely small of the number of incidents of mass violence that happens in movie theaters. It's so infinitely small. I was reading this one ridiculous statistic, but it's true. If, if you think about it, there, there have been 14 people um, have, have died in incidents of mass theater violence in the last four years, going back to Aurora, Colorado, and the terrible incidents that happened there. Um, does that mean that we should now really react, take huge extreme measures, metal detectors in movie theaters, armed guards, all that kind of stuff? Put it this way. One statistic I read today, now that's uh, 14 people in four years, that's like 3.5 people per year. Averaging that out, that's 3.5 people per year. This one weird statistic I read is that 13 people a year die in vending machine accidents, where a vending machine will fall over and kill somebody, 13 times a year. Now I've read some reports that said as low as three people per year, I've read some reports that said as high as 15. I think the most reliable source I read said 13. So let's go with 13 for now for argument's sake. Does that mean we ban vending machines? That we have every vending machine has to have a guard at it to make sure it stays up and is held up? And obviously not. These, I mean, 40,000 people die every year in a car accident. You are far more likely. You're like a thousand times more likely to die in the drive to the movie theater than you are to have anything happen to you at the movie theater. And just as a film fan at this point, I would say to my fellow film fans, well, let's not overreact. Yeah, the, the actions of a deranged person happened, but it could have happened in a convenience store. It could have happened in a laundromat. It could have happened in you know a government building. It could have happened in, in a shopping. It could have happened anywhere. It happened in a movie theater. And that's unfortunate and that sucks and that's terrible and the tragedy this happened and we can't even begin to grasp the, the gravity of it. But at the same time, we should not overreact in the sense and think that now all movie theaters need to become locked down and hyper secure. It's like, it's statistically speaking, a movie theater is one of the safest places in the world, statistically speaking. So I, that's just kind of my two cents on it. You know, I already talked yesterday about, you know, how our hearts and, and our hearts and our thoughts and our well wishes go to everybody in the whole community in Lafayette, Louisiana. That horrible tragedy there is just awful. But my thought today is like, we as film fans should not, now not overreact and think we need to lock down movie theaters at some sort as if this is some kind of pandemic because as of right now, it's really not. And the movie theater is still a really safe place to be. And uh, that's coming from a guy who doesn't work for AMC theaters anymore. So take that for what you will. Anyway, this is mailbag. So let's get on with the actual mailbag questions today. And the first mailbag question today comes to us from Brad. And Brad writes, hey guys, I'm loving the show. It's been discussed that one of the weak points of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is arguably the villains. Could this be because Marvel hasn't been allowed to use some of their best villains, including Doctor Doom, Galactus, Magneto, and up until recently, the Green Goblin? Thanks, and keep up the great work. Yeah, that's a discussion I've heard a lot. Now, I, everybody knows if you watch, you know, Collider video at all, you know I am a big, big fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I've loved almost, not quite, I've loved almost every one of the films they've put out, and I, I'm a huge fan of the newest film, Ant-Man, and I'm a big fan of the Cinematic Universe. But one of my criticisms of Ant-Man, despite how much I loved it, is that the villain in the film kind of becomes an afterthought in the film. And if you step back and think about it, aside from Loki, has the Marvel Cinematic Universe and all their great films had really strong, deep, important villains in their movies? Like to the point, like, uh, like Hans Gruber in Die Hard, you know, has the Marvel Cinematic Universe had its Darth Vader? And the answer to that is no, they haven't. It's That's been one of the weak spots. And you know, just because I'm a fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe doesn't mean I don't, I don't close my eyes and pretend that the weaknesses aren't there. It, that's one of the weaknesses. And a bunch of film fans and friends of mine, that sometimes the discussions come up, well, do we think maybe, and, and just like what Brad is asking the question, do we think maybe the part of the reason is because they're not using the right villains from, from the comic books? And my feeling on that is, and this is just my feeling, but my feeling on that is absolutely not. That has nothing to do with it. You can take, movies have taken characters from the comic books, but that's irrelevant what, what character they pull out of the comic book. It's almost irrelevant. It's how then do the filmmakers use that character, okay? 
Ronin. I actually liked Ronin in Guardians of the Galaxy, so maybe I shouldn't use... I know some people didn't like Ronin. I know Schnepp didn't, wasn't all that thrilled. He loved Guardians of the Galaxy. He didn't think Ronin was all that. I thought Ronin was a good villain. So maybe that's uh, a, a bad example. But let's take say, for instance, uh, and use for argument's sake, Ronin. Okay? Or I forget the name of the dark elf who was in Thor 2. Whatever. You know, the writers... And the movie makers and the directors, they take that character. And that character can be a great, rich, deep, on-screen character. The question becomes, what kind of a movie are the producers and the director and the writers setting out to make? What type of movie? What's the feel of the movie? What's the tone of the movie? And in within that, you answer the question, what is the purpose of the villain in this movie? And when you look at a movie like Ant-Man, what you really realize is that Ant-Man, and then this becomes true of a lot of Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, I think, personally. Ant-Man wanted to focus on Ant-Man. It wanted to focus on Scott Lang. It wanted to focus on uh, Hank Pym. It wanted to focus on Hope. It wanted to focus on those characters. And to keep the spotlight on those characters, they only use the villain as the motivating factor to push the heroes on their journey. The villains don't become spotlighted characters in and of themselves. So when somebody like me says that, yeah, one of the weak spots has been that the villains become somewhat forgettable uh, in many ways, at the same time, you can make the argument that that is probably on purpose. That is probably by design by the Marvel you know, hierarchy because they know what they want their overall movie experience to be and the villain himself is not really a part of that. The villain, in many ways in Marvel films, just becomes a plot device to, like I said, motivate and push the hero characters along their journey doing what they need to do. And then the, the spotlight of the, of the action and of the movie stays on those characters, those heroes that they're as they are motivated by the villain to move ahead and progress their storyline. And the camera never really comes back this way to focus on the villain. The result, for Marvel at least anyway, has been great movies, but you know, the payoff is that you, you had an underused and probably somewhat forgettable villain character. But at the end of the day, that doesn't really matter in most cases. It doesn't really matter because what the villain as a plot device caused the heroes to do, and with the camera staying on the heroes, created a great cinematic experience for us, right? Now, sometimes uh, what can happen is that that villain character is so misused, they become a weight on the movie and they become distracting in the movie. Uh, Mickey Rourke in Iron Man 2. That was terrible. I mean, that was just awful. That whole character was just a waste. And I almost felt like in Iron Man 2, they tried early on to have more focus on the villain, but that didn't work. Part of it would be because Mickey Rourke decided he was going to mail it in and didn't really do much with the character at all. Secondly, they, you know, the filmmakers didn't help much. I thought the script was kind of poor for it, and it didn't work. And I almost feel like the mistakes they made in Iron Man 2 kind of then laid the groundwork as they move forward in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They say, you know what? Let's not put too much emphasis on our villains. Let's just have the camera on them when we need to have the camera on them just to establish why the heroes are being motivated to do what they want to do. And then after that, let's take the cameras off the villains and put them back on the heroes because that's what is giving us our best results. So I can kind of see it. So, you know, would it be any different if they had Kingpin? Would it be any different if they had Doctor Doom? Would it be any different if they had Galactus? And my theory at this point at any rate, maybe your theory will be different, is no, it wouldn't be any different at all. Marvel would still use their formula that it was working for them to utilize the villain simply as a way, as a plot device, to spark the key uh, elements that are causing our heroes to take their journey. And they would do the same thing with all the rest of them, I believe. So is this perception that Marvel Cinematic Universe villains are kind of the weak spot in their films, is that a correct perception? I think it is. 
But would that change if they just use some of the other villains from the comic books? Nope, wouldn't change at all because it would still be the same filmmakers, the same writers who are making the same plot decisions based on how they want to use their villains. And that wouldn't change. All right, that's just my opinion. Let me know what you think. Jump into the comments section. Let me know your thoughts. What parts do you agree with me? What parts do you disagree? I want to hear what you think about this. All right, let's move on to the next topic. And the next topic today comes to us from Julian Tinoco, who writes, Hi, Collider. My question is, Given that Jurassic World got a big hit at the box office, that's an understatement, um, do you think that if they made another Jaws movie, do you think that could also have great success? Thanks and keep up the good work. Well, you know, there's been a lot of talk and questions about, you know, Jaws. Re there's been talk and discussions around Hollywood for a number of years now about maybe rebooting Jaws. Um, and I think ultimately they just realized now's not the time but you bet your ass at some point somebody's going to remake Jaws. It's going to happen. But I, when you're asking, hey, they remade Jurassic Park and not remade it, but they restarted it with Jurassic World and ha is now the third highest grossing film of all time. Could the same thing happen with Jaws? I think the two are not comparable at all. These are two totally different movies and movie franchises. And they're completely different types of movies as well. I mean, if you really look back at the original Jaws, which is awesome, by the way, if you have not seen the original Jaws, please do me and yourself, more importantly, a favor. Get a hold of it, sit down for an evening, set a couple hours aside and watch Jaws and then thank me later and thank all of your friends who've been telling you forever to watch Jaws to thank you later. It is, it's a masterpiece. It's incredible. You're going to love it anyway. Um, but it's a very different um, kind of movie. You know, it's not it's not action fantasy. It's the original Jaws. Really, I I have these arguments with my friends. The original Jaws to me is a horror film. Um, to me, that's how it feels because it will scare the life out of you. You will not want. I mean, the I think the big marketing tagline for Jaws when it was out was, "You won't want to go back in the water again." I remember as a little kid, even if we were in a lake, I didn't want to go in the water after seeing Jaws. I mean, it just freaked me out. Um, so if they re-released Jaws or did a restart or a reboot of Jaws now, would it, could it become one of the top 10 biggest box office films of all time? Well, look, anything can happen. Um, you know, that whole useless saying, well, if you got the right writers and the right directors and the right actors and the right script, could, I mean, anything could be the top 10. You, I could, you know, flip a the sentient dancing microphone. I can make, you know, I've, I've said this before, you've heard me say it, but it's true. I could make a movie about Felipe, the sentient dancing microphone, okay? If it had the right script and the right director and the right actors and the right studio and the right support and the right marketing campaign, could that be a hit? Then yeah, it could. It absolutely could. So that's, that's why that theory always drives me nuts when, you know, somebody will say to me, you know, uh, would a Dragon Ball Z movie... Uh, you know, could that be a hit in North America? And, I, and I'd say no. Well, John, they'd say, if it has the right director and the right script, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, anything. You say right director, right script, right premise, right studio, blah, 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 put all the stars in alignment for it, then yes, it's possible. But you could say that about anything. So then it becomes a question about what property becomes the best starting point. And Felipe, the sentient dancing microphone, as much as I would love him to become a hit movie and make me millions, he is not the right starting point uh, to, you know, to do something like that. Could Jaws do what Jurassic World did? I don't think so. I think it could be good. I think it could be very good and I think it could be a success. But would it be a retake of Jurassic World? I don't think so, because Jurassic World had a lot of different variables going for it. Like, everybody loves giant dinosaur dinosaurs, it, it, you know, interacting with modern time, giant monsters, the big visual effects spectacle, all that kind of stuff. It just had all these different elements rolled into one. And then some kind of lightning in a bottle happened. Because if you saw me talk about it, you know I like Jurassic World a lot. I had a very good time watching that movie, and I, recommended, I recommend people go see it. I liked it. But it wasn't a fantastic movie, by my estimation at any rate. You know, I think it's Rotten Tomatoes read, read, uh, meter right now is like it's 71%. The fan, re, the fan re rating for it, I believe, is 82. And I think both those numbers are, are right. It's, that, those are good numbers. Those are very good numbers. But is, are they elite numbers? Are they fantastic numbers from either audiences or critics? And the answer to that is no. So some kind of lightning in a bottle also struck with it. 
Could that happen with Jaws? As I said, anything is possible, I really doubt it. I think they're just two completely different situations and I don't think we can compare the two. All right, let's move on to the next item up today. And the next item today comes to us from Chris Voth. And Chris writes, love the new show. Thank you very much, Chris. At Comic-Con, Brian Fuller himself said that Hannibal, the TV series, may be a feature film if they could get no buyers for season four. I was wondering what you guys think about that. Would you like to see Hannibal go to feature? Well, it's a great question. I got to say up front, Hannibal is one of those shows that I have not watched yet. Uh, I know there are several people on the Collider video crew who do watch it or have watched it, I should say, past tense, um, and really recommend it. I Everybody I know that actually that has seen Hannibal as a TV show really likes the show. And... Uh, so I gotta I gotta binge watch it at some point so to catch up to it. So at Comic Con recently, every a lot of people know. In case you don't know, Hannibal has been canceled, and what has happened now is that the show producers have been trying to shop the show around for another network or another body to pick it up so it could do a season four. They've tried Amazon, they've tried Netflix, they've tried the other television networks, and so far everybody's taking a pass on it. So at Comic Con during the Hannibal panel. Uh, you know, one of the writers for the show said, you know, hey, there's a chance we may make a feature film out of it to wrap up the story. Here's the problem, though, with the notion of a feature film. Now, remember, I haven't seen Hannibal, so I am neither, I, I'm purely objective about this because I ni neither dislike the show or like the show because I haven't seen it. So I'm just coming at it from a purely objective point of view here. Um, the, what you got to keep in mind is that the show is getting canceled for a reason. The reason it's getting canceled is nobody watched it. Um, now, I just did, uh, the other night, I looked up just some some preliminary numbers. From what I saw a couple of weeks uh, in the ratings that I looked at, they got like 1.2 million viewers. 1.2 million viewers. More people watch Collider video every week than watched Hannibal. I mean, that's great. I mean, Hannibal had one episode. We have like 10 episodes that go up in a week, but still, I mean, it's, those aren't good numbers. And so the show's getting canceled. So what studio would wanna come along and put up $20 million to make a feature film out of Hannibal when nobody was watching it on TV for free? And even if, and we know they won't, but even if all 1.2 million of those people who watched Hannibal went out to watch the movie, that's about $10 million it'll make. $10 million total. Movie theaters won't want to put that in their theaters because they're not going to get enough people to come into theaters to buy popcorn and candy to justify taking up the screen. Why would we want to do that? Let's just put Jurassic World on that screen and make more money. Um, studios won't get behind it. So when Brian, and I think Brian knows that. So when Brian says, if we can't find a network, maybe we'll make a feature out of it. I think Brian, when he said that, he knows that when he says a feature film, he ain't talking about in your local movie theater because no studio will finance that and no movie theaters will want to put it in that. There's just not an audience for it. So maybe what he meant by that is to make like a two hour movie that then just the movie goes on Netflix or goes on Amazon or goes on Google or goes on YouTube or goes wherever as a two hour feature that they make for $2 million. Maybe they can make four or $5 million off of it. So would I want to see it? I can't say because I haven't seen the TV show. I don't know. Would it be a wise, could we ever see it in the movie theaters? I say it's pretty much an impossibility that it will. The numbers just don't add up. Could we see it as a direct VOD, direct to television, direct to a streaming service, a small film project? Yes, I think that's possible and I won't be surprised if that actually ends up happening. They might do like a Kickstarter thing or something, but I believe I believe one way or another, I'll believe you'll see a Hannibal wrap up, but it'll be, you know, streamed VOD sort of a situation. All right, let's go to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Lee. And Lee writes, why is Freda Pinto not a bigger star? When Slumdog Millionaire came out in 2008, she was considered one of the next breakout stars in Hollywood. She appeared on Most Beautiful Lists. She became a spokesperson for L'Oreal. She even, be, she even, she was even been in a Bruno Mars music video. However, aside from the uh, one high profile film, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, most of her movies have been forgettable. 
She was rumored to be the next James Bond girl at one point, but that fell through. Looking ahead, she is slated for another high-profile ape-themed film in 2017, Jungle Book Origins, coincidentally directed by her Rise of the Planet of the Apes co-star Andy Serkis. But that's it. Why, in your opinion, did Freda Pinto never become the A-list actress we all thought she could have been? Um, great question. Thank you so much for the question. First of all, though, let's say, hey, she was in a Bruno Mars music video. That, that is not the earmark of Hollywood super A-list superstar. Just saying. So <laughs> let's not use that as a big example. But yeah, when she was in Slumdog Millionaire, she was a revelation. I mean... She she has to be one of the most beautiful women in the world. Like, forget Hollywood. Freda Pinto has to be one of the most beautiful women on the planet. She is breathtakingly gorgeous. I have stood face to face with Miss Pinto. And I will tell you this. However good looking you think she is on the movie screen, your knees will go weak. If you're a heterosexual man, your knees will go weak standing in her presence. She is stunningly beautiful. It's an eloquent and just, you know, far too classy for 99% of the male population in the world. Uh, she's amazing. And then she was in Immortals um, with Henry Cavill, Mickey Rourke. Mickey Rourke was terrible in that movie. I, sorry, I don't, I don't mean this episode to become the let's crap on Mickey Rourke episode. I'm just saying he was bad in that movie. Um, and I didn't hate Immortals. I actually, I actually kind of got a kick out of Immortals. But I'll say Freda Pinto wasn't really super strong in it. And in Rise of the Planet of the Apes, she also wasn't really super strong. She was not bad. She certainly wasn't a distraction. And I certainly had no problem with her in the movie. But she, she wasn't, she didn't really stand out. She didn't grab her character by the throat, you know, and really make it stand out. Now, that's not always her job to do. Maybe that's what the director wanted the character to be, and that's fine. So why isn't she a bigger star right now? I mean, you could ask that question about any one of a thousand actresses. Why aren't they a big star right now? Well, answer number one is because there's only a very small window of who are the big A-list superstar actors or actresses. There's a very small club. So you really can't ask the question, why aren't they in there? Really, you should more look at is there enough evidence for why they should be in there? And with Freda Pinto, I'll say right now, there's probably not. There's not a mountain of evidence. There's not a mountain of overwhelming evidence that she should be absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, one of the A-list actresses in Hollywood. There's not enough evidence there yet to really make that argument. So the question is not, why isn't she in there? The question, the real question we should be asking is, do we think there's enough there to justify saying she should be one of them and at this point, a Bruno Mars video, uh, a relatively small role in a fantasy film, Immortals, that really didn't wasn't all that good, and a third or fourth level, level character in Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Is that enough, and being a spokesperson for L'Oreal, is that enough to say we have irrefutable proof that she should be an A-list lister? And unfortunately, it's not. Um, and I'm going to get in some trouble for bringing this up, but but it's the truth. It's an unfortunate truth in Hollywood. I also think her, she has a difficult time. She struggles a bit with a purely North American accent. She struggles with that. And I think that becomes a challenge for somebody who comes with, a, with an accent, whatever accent it is. I think it becomes a challenge because that limits the amount of roles that become available to those actors or actresses in Hollywood. Right or wrong, I, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. Uh, please don't get mad at me for saying that. I'm, I'm just saying that's, that's, that's the fact. And there's a great debate to be whether or not Hollywood should do act that way or should not act that way, but that's not what this debate is. This, I'm just saying, you're asking me why do I think reasons are Fred Pinto isn't one of the big superstars right now. I think her accent is, is one of those reasons. Um, it's, I, I'm not happy that that's considered a reason, but I, I think that's one of the reasons. Anyway, put her in anything, I will be there to see it. I personally think she's uber talented. She is, as I said, one of the most beautiful in the world, and she has an eloquence and intelligence. She's also right now like a big spokesperson for women's rights, uh, particularly like in India and things like that. She's, and I've been watching interviews with her talking about those issues, and she is actually kind of scary smart 
to go along with being eloquent and talented and stunningly beautiful. Like she's the full package in many ways. So you put her in anything, I will be there. I'm hoping that this Jungle Book movie will re-spark a lot more interest in her once again, like Slumdog Millionaire did. And maybe we'll see a little bit of resurgence to see her get another crack at getting into that A-list status. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Chris Chance. And Chris writes, I was wondering about movie releases, more specifically on Batman vs. Superman release dates. This seemingly euphoria bringing movie opens on the 25th of March in the United States, whereas here in Sweden, where I'm at, it opens on the 6th of May. So I was wondering, why? And also, if you guys could talk about what makes distributor choose different dates and not just release and not just release the movie on the same date globally. Thanks a lot for the question, Chris. We've kind of we've addressed this, or I've addressed this question before, probably about a year ago. Um, let me go back a little bit. Back in the day when there was a lot of debate and discussion going on about film piracy, and uh, you know how do we stop film piracy? I came across these studies, and I talked about this on the show that we're seeing you know, a lot of the film piracy originates and is driven because of the of Asian markets in China and stuff like that, where there's a hunger for North American Hollywood film. And what was happening was a lot of times movies were opening in North America before they would open in a lot of other countries. And that those countries and the demand for those movies, those pirated movies, drove a lot of the online piracy traffic. And I remember saying at the time, this is going back a couple of years actually, is I think part of the culprit of that was staggered release dates. You know, my feeling was you're releasing a movie here in the United States and not releasing it elsewhere in the world. And everybody, but we have one internet now. This isn't 1981 where all people had was their local television shows and the newspapers, right? The internet's here now. And they're on the internet watching everybody in the United States freak out about this amazing Avengers movie, right? Or Ant-Man or whatever, whatever, whatever movie you want to talk about. So there, everybody's freaking out. People are loving it, blah, blah, blah. And here I am. I'm in the Philippines. I'm in Sweden. I'm in China. I'm wherever you want to talk about. I want to go see the movie. I want to see this movie that you've been showing me trailers online for, getting me excited. Now I'm seeing other people in the world are seeing it and loving it. I want to, here's my money. Here's my money. Take my money. Let me see the movie. But there are no options for me to see the movie. And therefore, you know, uh, there's a demand now is created and people want to see it. And so they turn to, to pirating it online so they can see it. I've always contended, I believed that if you released the film, if you had one global release date for your big movies, I believe that would take a lot of the sting out of piracy. I Look, I think most people are not thieves. Call me crazy for thinking that. Maybe I am crazy for thinking that. But anyway, I'm going to choose to believe that most people are not thieves. Most people do not want to steal. Most people, all they need is a legitimate, convenient way for them to consume your product. And if you're going to market to them, this movie's great, and then let them see that other people in the world are enjoying the movie and loving it, and you don't get to see it wherever you're watching this on the internet, you don't get to see it for three more months, <laughs> guess what? Then you are kind of pushing that person to become a movie pirate. I be I've always believed that one global release date will, will do more to hurt piracy than almost anything else you can possibly do. Anyway, that's a side thing going on a bit of a rant. Uh, as far as why then, what are some of their motivations? What are some motivations of a studio to release things here on one date and here on another? Um, I think there are several factors to go into it. I've talked to some publicity people from different studios and they've all given different answers, but they all kind of fit the same theme. It's marketing strategy. You know, opening a movie on one weekend in the United States may be a great idea, but that one particular weekend happens to be this very special holiday in another country where you know, people stay at home with their families and therefore we don't want to release it in on that day in that uh, in that market. Or maybe they feel like, hey, uh, sometimes movies, I think Marvel has done this a lot lately, sometimes movies open in other markets before they open the United States, but very close, like maybe a week apart or two weeks apart, not like a month and a half. And I think that happens when they have a lot of faith in their movie and in North America, they advertise the film and then it opens in some other countries first 
and then the people in those countries love it and that just feeds the hunger for people in the United States to get more excited about it. It's like people in London, when a movie opens up there, they're talking, oh my gosh, this movie's awesome. And everybody's in the United States is like, oh, well, well, then why don't I get to see it? And then a week later it opens and even more people go to see it. So I think it's all about marketing strategy. It's all about, you know, analyzing each individual market and when this particular movie might perform its best in that particular country. And sometimes it would be, that's fine to release it on the same day that opens the United States. Maybe that means it'll be better to open on another date. I still am an advocate though for a global release date. I'm so, release your movie August 10th, period, worldwide, August 10th, it's available. Um, but like I said, the people who are making the, these decisions to stagger these releases, they are you know, in all likelihood, far more intelligent than I am. And I'm sure they've got very good reasons. But for me and my limited intelligence, I still believe that a global release date would be best. That's just my opinion. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from James McKenzie. And James writes, hey, Collider crew, how's it going? My question is, how would you rank the Batman films? All of them, from Burton to Schumacher to Nolan. What is your favorite or not so favorite, and why? Well, thanks a lot for the question, James. I'm not gonna go too deep into the and why, or else that'll be like a 20 minute review of each Batman movie, and I'm not gonna do that. Um, but I will, okay, so, uh, seven major Batman films, and I will start at this. At number seven, obviously, Batman and Robin. That was just an abortion of a film. Uh, horrible and rotten from start to finish with almost no redeeming qualities whatsoever. It is, in my opinion, the only truly start to finish awful Batman film. All the other Batman films are have much more redeemable qualities, uh, but Batman and Robin, to me, the one with Mr. Freeze, uh, that is the one to me that is the worst of the Batman films. At number six for me will be uh, um, B Batman 2. Batman 2, the one with Michael Keaton um, and uh, the Penguin and Catwoman. And while Catwoman was great in it, and I thought Danny DeVito's performance of Cobblepot was great, I just didn't like the character that they created with it. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think I don't I don't hate Batman 2, but I just generally, just by a little bit, I just don't like it. I didn't like Batman 2. Now, Batman 2 has a following, and there are people out there who just love this film, and that's awesome. For me, it's one that is not a bad film, but just barely, if there's that line that on this side of the line, I like the movie, on this side of the line, I don't like the movie, I'm just barely under that line, so that's for me, but Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman, forget about it. Um, at number five, I know other people might rate this one lower, but number five for me is Batman Forever. Um, as ridiculous as Tommy Lee Jones's Two-Face was, as ridiculous as Jim Carrey's Riddler was, and the introduction of Robin, and all that kind of stuff, for whatever reason, I enjoyed that film. I thought there was enough, it was, I mean, not, if you release that movie today, I probably don't like it. But I remember at the time, you know, when we hadn't, we weren't in the superhero movie renaissance yet, in the true golden age of superhero movies that we're in right now. I remember I had some laughs. I got some giggles and I had some enjoyment. I thought Val Kilmer was actually a pretty good Batman. Um, you know, is he my top three favorite Batman? No, but I thought he was a pretty good Batman. He was not bad. And I thought there were things like, okay, so number seven is Batman and Robin. Number six is Batman 2. Number five is Batman Forever. Number four, Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight Rises. Um, my least favorite of the Christopher Nolan films, um, not just my not just of my uh, least favorite of my Christopher Nolan Batman films, but my least favorite of Christopher Nolan movies. Uh, I probably liked it less than any other, of, of his other movies. It, it was a, to me, it was a big step down from The Dark Knight, but it's in my number four spot. I thought it was enjoyable. I liked it. I thought Christopher Nolan, like I said, if, if I made 10 Hollywood movies and The Dark Knight Rises was my, that was my worst then I'm one of the greatest directors of all time. And, and that's, that's arguably what you can say about Christopher Nolan is that he is poised, you know, 10 years from now, I think we're 10, 15 years now, we're talking about Christopher Nolan as one of the greatest uh, Hollywood directors of all time, especially if The Dark Knight Rises, which is a good film, stays as his worst film. 
then you're talking about a very special filmmaker. So The Dark Knight Rises to me is my number four favorite. My number three favorite Batman film is Batman Begins. I, I just adored that movie. It, you know, it, it kind of, it reintroduced us to what Batman could be on the big screen. And I thought, you know, what Chris, it, it really introduced a lot of people. Though there are some people who are already very turned on to Christopher Nolan, but for a lot of people, like because of Memento and things like that. But, um, but Batman Begins was a lot of people's introduction to Christopher Nolan and what a special filmmaker he is. And it brought us all into this world of Batman and just great film. My number two favorite Batman film. Well, you all are going to guess what my next two are. My number two favorite Batman film is the first Tim Burton Batman. Um, that was a movie that was ahead of its time, like really ahead of its time. When you watch that movie now and remember what comic book movies were like in that era, Tim Burton's Batman really is the one film out of that era that if you released it today fits the most. Out of any film from that era, it fits more. Tim Burton's Batman far more, if it was just released today, would far more fit in, in today's movie culture than say Donner's original Superman movie. You know, it, it's just, it was a movie that was ahead of its time. And it's just an incredibly special film. If you haven't seen the original Tim Burton, Michael Keaton, uh, Batman, go watch it. Please watch it. And obviously, like everybody else on the planet, my favorite Batman film is Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight. Uh, that just elevated to a whole new level. Um, once again, kind of highlighting my disappointment with The Dark Knight Rises because I, I wanted it to top it, but that's a tall order. Um, so once again, my favorite Batman films in order. Number seven, uh, Batman and Robin. Number six, Batman 2, the Tim Burton film. Number five, Batman Forever. Number four, The Dark Knight Rises. Uh, number three, Batman Begins. Number two, Batman, the original Tim Burton Batman, and my number one Batman film for me personally is The Dark Knight. All right, two more questions to go. Let's get into it. So the next question comes to us from LeVar Anthony. And LeVar Anthony writes, even before it was cool to stay through the end credits, this was something I normally do. I've always seen that most films have a second unit director. What is that exactly? My assumption is that this is the person that handles some of the action or people or the stars walking down the street for a scene transition. But really, I have no idea. So what does a second unit director do? Thanks a lot for the question, LeVar. Yeah, a second unit director can, can do, it's much like a producer term. It can mean different things on different movies. For the most part, um, a second unit director, remember, shooting movies is expensive. Time is money. And so... At the beginning of production, or in the beginning of when you're starting to do the pre-production on a film, you get somebody in who's like a line producer, right? And they look at, you know, everything that's got to be shot. And they try to figure out a way to most effective and effectively and efficiently shoot everything. Because, you know, the shorter amount of time they can shoot this in, the cheaper it's going to be. And what they will quite often do is, you know what? There are a lot of these scenes. There, there are certain things here that we need shot that... We can shoot somewhere else at the same time while the director and the main stars and whatever are off shooting this other stuff. We can, like that shot of a car driving down the street in the middle of the day, that shot of the person walking into the store and buying a, a bag or a, you know, a package of bubble gum or, you know, things like that. We can probably shoot those at the same time across town if we get another production crew over there shooting that at the same time while our main director with his main movie stars are over handling this dramatic scene with all this dialogue. And so for that second unit, they need a director for that second unit. And the second unit director will go off and shoot those cutaway shots like you were describing in your, in your question. They will shoot, you know, you know, transitional scenes. They'll shoot things like that, you know, scene inserts and, and different types of stuff like that. And sometimes they'll work with actors and some dialogue uh, at the same time. That happens as well. And the second unit director is responsible for all that. Now, in the case of like a big action scene, sometimes the second unit director will be like an action specialist. And so there's a great example of on the Bourne films, you know, while... Matt Damon is rigging himself up to do this, this big stunt shot. The second unit director, who's also their action specialist, was actually overseeing that while the main director was off with a couple of the other key characters in the movie shooting a dialogue scene, shooting a scene with more acting in it and, and overseeing that. So 
a lot of times second unit director, the, the small cutaway stuff, the, the stuff that doesn't require the primary actors in the film to be in, something that doesn't have a lot of dialogue, that can be shot at the same time while the actor and the first unit are off shooting other more important scenes in the movie. And sometimes it also means the, the guys who look after the heavy action stuff. But like the term producer, and like I said at the beginning, uh, a second unit director can, can be a little bit of a different role from movie to movie, depending on the needs of that movie and the needs of that director. All right, hope that helps. All right, now we get to the final question on this Saturday. And the final question today comes from Prophet, who writes, what are your thoughts on the report that the Revenant uh, movie shoot was a living hell according to crew members? Do you think sometimes when a director is chasing their vision, it may cause a rift with the people that work for them? They say pressure makes diamonds. Does this theater work in the movie business? Well. Yeah, we're talking about that movie, The Revenant, uh, with Alejandro Inarritu, who's directing it. He just did Birdman, won the Academy Award for Best Director for that, deservedly so. And he's working with Tom Hardy and Leonardo DiCaprio. And, I mean, yeah, this shoot sounds like hell. Um, Alejandro has come to this movie with a very specific vision. He wants it to feel as immersed and as real as possible. And... One of the things he's doing in this movie, which I have not seen done before personally, I'm sure it's happened, I'm just saying I'm not aware of them. He is only shooting with natural light, which means there's not you know, this huge lighting crew. You come into any studio or go into any movie set, there's lights and reflectors and you know, bouncers and everything all over the place you know, to get the right light. He is apparently shooting with nothing but natural light, which is kind of nuts and they're shooting in the environment like he's taking his crew out into the middle of nowhere where it's cold and frigid and miserable and apparently there have been lots apparently there's been you know uh breakdowns between the producer and the director in this film apparently they're not speaking to each other anymore um a lot of the a lot of the crew has left and quit or have been fired and replaced with other crew and all this kind of stuff and it has been a nightmare like nothing like um, apocalypse now that Francis Ford Coppola had to go through, but apparently this is one hell of a set and all that kind of stuff. Is this good or bad for the movie? It really depends. Look, I say this all the time. There are a lot of people who become somewhat responsible for how good or how bad a movie is. You know, the, the performances of the actors, the, the score of the movie, the visual effects, all, lots of different things. But when it comes down to it, studio interference or not, the most important and most responsible person for how the final product is delivered is the director of the film. And the director's job, if they're worth their weight, is to have a vision of what the final product of this movie is going to be. And then that director has to do what they, he or she needs to do to make sure that vision happens. Because guess what? In six months or in four months, we're not going to be making this movie anymore. The movie's going to be done in the can, but then the movie will be out there forever. And the director, if they're good, knows that they need to do what they need to do to get to forget this three month experience that we're going to have making the movie. That doesn't matter. What matters is once the movie's done and now it is out there forever. It is their job to get that forever part to be exactly what they need it to be. And that means the director's job is not to make friends. But, you know, lots of times the directors and the crews they work with are great friends and they have a great time and that's awesome when that can happen. But that's not the director's responsibility. The director's responsibility is not to make it a fun, great experience for everybody working with him to make that movie. No, the director's first responsibility is to take that vision about what the movie should be and make it happen. And you do what you need to do to make that happen. If you burn some bridges, if you make some enemies, if you make whatever, whatever. Your job is to make that movie the vision that you have it being. To make it as good as it can possibly be. Because once you're done shooting the movie, that's three months. Who cares? That's done. That's gone now. But The Revenant, the movie. Apocalypse Now, the movie. Return of the Jedi, the movie. Whatever it's going to be is now going to be out there and live on forever. And people are going to be watching it and seeing it. And, you know, you got to, you have to focus on that. And sometimes that means for a difficult work environment. I mean, the only thing I can say is that I really hope that the filmmakers paint an accurate picture for the crew that get involved. 
Like, don't tell the crew, oh, it's gonna be great. We're gonna have these nice warm tents and tons of food and hot, hot, you know, blankets and all the, you're gonna be comfortable and it's gonna be awesome. And then you get out there and it's cold and damp and miserable. And you were told you're gonna be working 14 hour days, but you're working 20 hour days, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. You hope that the filmmaker paints an accurate picture, it says, look, you come and work with me, it's gonna be this, this, and this will be the great things, but this, this, and this, this are gonna be the hard things. And these hard things are gonna be there. Do you wanna come and work on it? And then hopefully they know what they signed up for. And when they went out there and they're miserable and they're cold, they knew what they signed up for. And if they decide it's too much and they wanna leave, that's fine, that's their, their thing. So I think that's the responsibility that, that a director has and that they have to focus on. Don't worry about what other people say. You know, Alejandro right now has to not care because I think he's still working on this movie. He has to not care what the crew is saying. He has to not care what people back in the US are saying, oh, you shouldn't be treating your crew so badly. He's got to ignore all that and he's got to get this movie made and get it made the way he believes it needs to be made. And uh, that's just the reality of it. Anyway, folks, that will do it for me for this installment of Collider Mailbag. Thank you so much for joining me on the Saturday. Once again, don't forget, tomorrow we're going to be doing this live. And it, a million things could go wrong. We're testing out some things in here. Maybe the live stream stops working halfway through. I don't know how it's going to happen. Um, but we're going to give it a shot, and I hope you join us. That'll be at 10 a.m., uh, Pacific Standard Time, Los Angeles Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I hope you're able to join me for that. And listen, don't forget, if you want your question on Mailbag or on Movie Talk Monday through Friday, email in your questions to collidervideo at gmail.com. That's how you send it in. And listen, don't forget, guys, we are now with the incredible news website, movie news website, entertainment website, collider.com. Make sure you bookmark that website if you want to stay up to date with that amazing team of writers they have over there. Staying up to date on everything going on minute by minute. Make sure you're subscribed or bookmark that website and subscribe to Collider Video's YouTube channel. So that'll do it for me, guys. Leave your thoughts and opinions in the, in the comment section below. I can't wait to read them. That'll do it for me. Now, my name is John Campion for Collider Video and until next time, bye-bye.